everybody. I hope that um, everybody enjoyed the breakout sessions. I was in Defy, and um, who was in it? It was awesome. It was great. Um, to start things off, in our next segment, we're going to explore what happens when venture capital meets entrepreneurial spirit. Is it the next billion dollar idea? Let's find out. Please welcome to the stage Fortune's Michal Levram and her panelists. So I was racking my brain last night trying to find a punchline because the tagline for this session was an entrepreneur and a VC walk into a bar. But I totally couldn't come up with anyone, so we're going to start on a more serious note. I mean, a bar class, um, right? What's that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I'm going to introduce my panelists briefly. Um, Rizwana Bashir is the founder and CEO of a company called Peak.com. Aileen Lee is the founder of Cowboy Ventures and a strategic advisor at Kleiner, Perkins, Caulfield, and Byers. Thank you guys for being here. Thanks. So um, quick list for you. See if you know what these uh, people have in common. Jack Dorsey, Eric Schmidt, Kosla Ventures. I know that's not one specific person. David Bonnerman from TPG. Do you have any idea what they have in common? <laughs> They're, they're they all invested in Rosanna's company. How did you do that? Um, so, you know, investing, whenever anyone says that raising capital is easy, they're lying. It's always difficult. It doesn't matter what the situation is. There's definitely some things you can put into place to make it easier for yourself. And so in my case, um, I'd worked at a company that had raised money from some of those people before. And so I'd been involved in that fundraising process, and so I'd had an opportunity to already pitch them on a concept that they liked and ended up investing in. And so I kind of had some credibility with them in order to be able to contact them and say, look, I'm working on something myself. Um, I have this fantastic co-founder, and we'd love to come in and talk to you about what we're doing. And so really having existing relationships, um, because I'd been working on a couple of startups before, allowed me to be able to have an in um, with those investors. And then I think there were a few things that investors really care about at the seed stage, which is when a lot of those guys came in, which, you know, they're really simple, actually. I think there's, there's three areas, and I'm sure Aileen can add, because as a seed stage investor, she kind of does that on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think there were three things people cared about. The first was just the market size. Um, I think with anyone who's going in to raise raise capital, people want to know that you could build a really valuable company. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, being able to say, okay, well, this is a $100 billion global market. And how, how did you describe Peak when you pitch people on it? Like, what was your one-liner? So I'd say the one-liner is open table for the activities market. Um, it always, you know, whenever people provide those descriptions, it's, it's tough, but um, it really is what we're doing. And we're providing um, a consumer marketplace to help consumers find fun things to do if they want to go kayaking or on a wine tour. But we also help these small businesses to come online and give them tours. And so that was a corollary that people could understand, and that helped. And so being able to say, well, you know, this has been done in other marketplaces before. So if you look at Open Table or Mind Body for yoga and Pilates studios that helping those come online, we had something that people could see. And then I think the second piece of that was around being able to show that the timing was different now. And I think for many of us, we're mm -hmm. focusing on mobile because a lot of the small businesses that we work with are offline. They're on a dock. They're in the zip lining canopy, ready to go. And so mm -hmm. they needed mobile to be able to run their business. And the third was the team. And I think investors care deeply, especially at the C-stage levels, that the co-founders have complementary skill sets that they might have relevant experience before. And so those were the three things we really focused on. Mm -hmm. And um, really then, you know, they're backing you with the hope that you're going to be able to do something Thing. And there's going to be different changes. There's going to be things you learn and you try that you don't kind of end up sticking with. And then, then I think there's an element of them caring about your grit and your persistence within the team. Um, and those were the those were the things we focused on. We didn't have a huge long deck. We kept it short, concise, and um, and pitched people. And the kind of once you get one person on board uh, that's that's kind of influential, it really helps shape other mm -hmm. people being able to come in. Because you're like, oh, Eric Schmidt's in. Are you in? Right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I, I don't think that's how it should be. Uh -huh, um, but it, I think but that it that totally you know, it's one of the challenges that you have, which is until one person comes in, no one will come in. You know, everyone's very kind of gun shy, and then all of a sudden you get one name, and the whole world wants to come in and, and start investing, and they don't really want to do any diligence anymore. So I think that is one of the challenges. I think in general, and I think that's something that the investing kind of community community has to have I, a more courage and, and be more um, you know more willingness to kind of go out and 
uh, and actually do the diligence themselves as opposed to you know hopefully you know free riding on someone else. So I think those yeah. are the things that really made a difference for us, and we were tremendously fortunate. Like a lot of this is luck, and I know that people don't like to kind of uh, you know kind of point out oh well we were quite lucky. Well you know it turns out the serendipity you meet this one person who introduces you to someone else, and they end up being this fantastic individual. So as an example, I worked at Guilt Group, and the president of Guilt Group actually ended up going out and being coming the CEO of Travelocity. Mm -hmm. Well that was really helpful. He ended up investing in the company and has had you know incredible network that he's well, it's, it's luck and developing relationships yeah, right and it's networking more than luck, so, though. I mean, yeah. a lot of it is also hustle yeah right and that is a lot of what <laughs> investors are looking for is does the ceo kind of have the hustle in a good way to be able to make things happen when they aren't like when there isn't momentum yeah i think you've done an incredible job at that and I, I should mention also that Aileen is not an investor in Peak, so this isn't going to be a complete love fest, right? <laughs> okay. um, so, and, and Aileen, I have, a, I have another list for you. So Rent the Runway, Dollar Shave Club, Good Technology, Bloom Energy, Shopkick, One King's Lane, and True and Co, my personal favorite. Oh, I'm so glad you like True and Co. <laughs> um, these are probably True and Co. <laughs> yeah, small plug for you. Um, these are all companies that Aileen has invested in. How do you pick them? It's, uh, so what I do is I work, I basically worked for a large firm called Kleiner Perkins for a long time and then two and a half years ago I started my own firm called Cowboy Ventures and what we do is we invest in technology startups, mostly software oriented startups and um, you know being here in San Francisco if you guys are not in tech you probably know that's like a lot of what goes on here and more than ever before, right? Like San Francisco actually wasn't that tech of a scene even five years ago, it was really in Silicon Valley and San Francisco was like a more normal city and in the past, in the past three years, I would say it has really just become one bedroom like, didn't cost four thousand. Oh, it cra it's <laughs> crazy! I mean, the, just the number of software startups here, and for a lot of different reasons, but it's just multiplied, mm -hmm. and the amount of like the number of companies has multiplied partially because it costs much less. It takes much less money than it used to even five years ago to start a software company. Before, you used to need to raise five or ten million dollars because you had to buy Oracle databases and you had to get space at Rackspace and you had to buy, like in, when I started in tech, you had to buy Sun servers and all that stuff, right? Now you can use Amazon Web Services, you can use open source code, you can do a bunch of things. So a team of two people, and you can learn how to code on Code Academy or Khan Academy or something like that. So, you know, a high school student or a college student with kind of pretty rudimentary coding skills can now build and ship an app with, you know, on $10,000 or something. So, so whereas like the industry that I kind of grew up in as a job for 15, you know, 13, 15 years where we were making five or $10 million decisions, what I, what I do at Cowboy, what we do at Cowboy is we make million dollar decisions. And with a million dollars, these teams can actually ship an app or a product um, and get millions of users. Um, and so it's, it's harder, I would say, than ever. Um, because there are so many more choices and also it really can be anyone. Like whereas 10 years ago, it really generally you needed to have people who had PhDs in computer science and had worked at big tech companies before and had a lot of experience. Really it now can be a person without a pedigree, without, ex like without a lot of experience that isn't even referenceable by people who you know at existing companies. So it's, it's harder than ever, but I think that actually makes it more exciting than ever, both because like the opportunity and also it's, it's hopefully gonna create a lot more diversity in an industry that has historically had very little diversity and so, very and, and you've, you've invested in, in quite a lot of yeah. female entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and I know we, we talk a lot about STEM and getting more women in STEM, but a lot of these entrepreneurs um, don't necessarily have technical backgrounds. That's not really necessary today to start a company, is it? No, it's not. I would say um, if you are building an enterprise software company that's planning on selling to you know, a Goldman Sachs or a Zurich or something, generally it is more helpful and it's more likely that a tech a founder or a co-founder with a technical background is like gonna be more useful, but especially if it's a consumer internet company, it's helpful to have a technical co-founder, but I, I mean, we look for actually to back teams of co-founders where it's not just one person, it's usually two people or three people, and one of them may have a technical degree, but one may be an awesome business development person or an awesome marketer or a great product person. Mm -hmm. um, and look, we actually look more for a combination of skills rather than everything in just one person. And, and you probably more so than anybody else um, is waiting for one of these unicorn companies yeah. to be led by yeah. a, a, a woman. And, yeah. and, and preferably probably one of your uh, portfolio companies. But can you kind of explain to everybody the study that you wrote sure. on, uni on billion dollar babies? First of all, what is a unicorn? So why are um, we having, why, why are there so many of them now? So um, a year and a half, kind of a year into the fund, 
One of the interesting things is like, unlike public markets, there's actually not a lot of data or research around venture capital or private companies. Like the story of them, how do they evolve? What are the key decisions that they made that caused YouTube to be the breakout hit against like eight other YouTubes at the same time, right? Or Facebook versus like, you know, a lot of other kind of social networks at the time. It's kind of interested in like we are, my job is to make great returns for my investors. And I don't, there's actually not a good body of learning like that exists that I can read and learn from. So we kind of said like, okay, let's do this. We've got this, you know, we've got a $40 million fund, kind of a clean sheet. Let's do our own learning. Let's go figure out like, you know, we know that venture capital returns historically are driven by billion dollar companies. How many actually are there? <laughs> Does anyone even, we didn't even really know how many there are, how many are built every year. Do they have anything in common? Do they have single founders or are they teams of people? Are they that kind of stereotypical 20 year old who dropped out of college and started a company in their dorm room or in, in their apartment versus, you know. So we basically spent about six months trying to create a body of work to understand what like what's the background and what do these companies have in common? And so we rewrote this article called like Welcome to the Unicorn Club about unicorn companies, which are companies that were basically built um, into be worth over a billion dollars in less than a decade. And what we found at the time, which was a year ago, was there's only 39 of them um, that are venture backed companies. That and name some of the ones that we would recognize. Um, Uber, mm -hmm. um, like Tesla was not on the list because it's more of a hardware company, um, Workday, Facebook, um, you know, the, and the, the, these happen like every decade there are unicorn companies like Amazon, like Facebook, like Twitter, um, Airbnb, Dropbox, mm -hmm. uh, Theranos in the life sciences category, which is a very exciting company. Um, exciting we'll hear more about, about Theranos yep. later. Uh, and so it was a great learning experience for us. But uh, like one of the sad things was that there are no female founders Zero. on the list. Um, and we're working on our second installment right now, and there are actually going to be some women founders and CEOs on the list, which is really exciting. Ooh. But um, I cannot say yet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, one of them actually is as Jayshree Yalal, who's the CEO mm -hmm. of Arista Networks, uh -huh. and she's an awesome technologist, and she's a, a technical founder who was at Cisco yeah. for a long time. Um, but she's running a multi-billion-dollar public company. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it's you know. I've, some of you may know venture capital. The, like it's kind of a small industry, maybe a little bit like hedge, like a little bit parallel to the hedge fund industry. But in, a study came out recently. There's only three percent of women in venture capital in the, at the general partner level. Like in 2014, that's crazy. Uh, and so we have a lot of work to do. But I think having helping see more females be successful and putting more pressure. Um, both men and women putting pressure on the industry to have more diversity or the things that we mm -hmm. need to do and to fix it. I would note that um, you know, that 3% is kind of mirrored in the entrepreneurs being backed yeah. by VCs as well. So the problem kind of probably starts to some degree with them not being enough women investing. And yeah. There aren't enough women who are getting backed by VCs. Can you, Rizwana, can you give tips? Just real quick, give us like a few of your biggest tips for fundraising. Because you've, you've had to go and pitch the company to a lot of investors. I think this is a really simple and basic one, but it's really about confidence. Um, I think in general, as women, we tend to be more kind of modest about what we're claiming. And when we walk in, um, we might not be as willing to share this huge vision about what could be achieved. We're much more comfortable saying, well, this is what we're definitely achieving. and We're, we're going to absolutely exceed these, um, these goals. And I think that in the end, the comparison point that investors often have are you know, male entrepreneurs who perhaps aren't as, aren't as cautious about what they're saying. And so you have this kind of delta in yeah. effectively perceived confidence. It doesn't actually mean that that's actually there um, that's, that's occurring. So I'd say one of the biggest pieces of advice I'd give to someone who's going in, and I think this applies to corporate life as well, is just that, you know, that confidence delta, people think it belies actually some kind of, you know, difference in capabilities, some difference in the business plan. It's not there. So in some ways, we actually have to start changing corporate cultures and, and, and the way that um, investors kind of react to these things. But also as women, I think we can just try and make sure we're extra assertive, perhaps a little bit more aggressive than we would have been in those meetings because I think that actually allows people to say, oh, okay, well, you know, she is just as confident as any of the other people that are coming in. The vision she's painting is not of a company that's gonna be $100 million, it's gonna be many billions of dollars. And I think that is something that I think 
it's a really simple lesson and I've got good friends that are, hate the fundraising process because they hate having to do that. Yeah. They hate having to conform to this ideal of, yeah. of, well, you have to be super confident and aggressive because that's just not their personality. Um, but yet, they've built companies that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. So I think it's something that absolutely has to change, but a very good tactical thing is just to go in and be extra confident. And I actually love Amy Cuddy's work on power posing. Um, she's a Harvard Business School professor and she talks about how you know there are poses you can hold for three minutes, and they may be placebos, but um, they give people extra confidence, you know, and they actually uh, really? reduce your cortisol levels. You do that. And they, um, you know, sometimes I did. I remember when I went to, to pitch for the series A, I did, you know. Uh, I was like, anything helps, you know. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, and also I've been uh, at show business us, school. Show us a power pose. Um, I know. What is it? <laughs> in front of I love mirror? the fact that I'm like, yeah, you know, it's about <laughs> making yourself as big as possible, uh -huh. right? And, um, and 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 it's you know like it's, you know if you had your legs kind of like you know wide, which I won't do because I'm. <laughs> skirt and that would be mildly inappropriate um, so um, you know um, it's things like that or putting your hands behind your um, behind your head and just making yourself as big and wide as possible and it turns out it boosts testosterone it reduces your cortisol levels so things like that and just if you have a technique for yourself which is you know this you know there's some some things that help me feel more confident and it de depends on who it is and what they do you know there's some people who will say look you know if I feel like I look appropriate so I'm wearing you know a dress that makes me feel really great about myself maybe that's it but I think the confidence thing actually ends up being the most kind of uh, has the most impact on something that's totally controllable but that we don't spend a lot of time thinking about last question for you guys because we're almost out of time um, how can people in this room, which you know, you heard there are a lot of industries represented yeah. here, not all technology for sure. How can they work, how should they work with Silicon Valley if they aren't already? With entrepreneurs, with investors? Um, so uh, we talked about this a little bit at dinner last night. So we, one of the really fun things about our job is we, you know, a lot of large companies are customers for a lot of small technology companies. And I think a lot of the senior folks at companies feel like they're kind of removed from what's next, what's up and coming. And so one of the things that we've seen a little bit more in the past five years is teams of, from large companies will come spend a day, three days in Silicon Valley and work with a, a team like us at Cowboy Ventures or the folks at Kleiner, Andreessen or Sequoia to basically kind of put together an itinerary of a couple days or a day to basically talk about like what's on your hit list, what do you want to learn about, what are trends that you want to discuss, small companies that you want to learn about, and we'll help put together kind of a day for you guys to immerse yourself in innovation culture or key new ideas. And it's, it's great for the companies to have a chance to access executives that it would take them forever to be able to get to, and hopefully it's great for your teams to be able to kind of like get some of the energy and get away from the office and think about like, yeah, why did these things take us so long? Or like, why don't we adopt some of these things? Or So it, it seems to be like a, and the other thing I would say is a lot of larger corporations with more resources and more experience have actually maybe some interesting gender bias or training things that we could probably use in Silicon Valley. So if your company has any interesting kind of internal tools to try and unpack gender bias or diversity bias, I think we are looking for something in Silicon Valley that we could we could roll out, to especially a lot of these smaller private companies where a lot more of the problems occur and we just don't have the resources. And we're, we're actually out of time. Oh, do you offer your tours you on peak.com, by the way? <laughs> your Silicon Valley tour. We should actually um, create a tour for Silicon yeah, Valley. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. The, the, um, the Cowboy Ventures tour. Um, I'm so sorry we're out of time. Definitely would have loved to hear more, but uh, power poses, right? We learned exactly. that. Um, thank you guys so much. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. You're exiting through here. Thank you.